chapter 5, verse 22, uh, one of the virtues in there, but I thought I would start a little bit in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. It says to walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. Sounds like a struggle already. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. We as believers have the presence of the enjoyment of the Holy Spirit, which gives us power for living for God. Man. It's the hardest thing to do. It was very easy in my past life to do the things I did that were wrong. It was so easy and it was fun. But now, to do what God wants me to do, I need His power and I need His strength. Amen? Amen. The form of the Greek verb translated walk means continuous action or an ongoing lifestyle. Walking also means progress. And as a believer, we submit or surrender to the control of the Holy Spirit. Then we'll learn to respond in obedience to God's command, commands of the Scripture. There's so many commands. I always talk to people about the commands of God. And people say, well, why do you do it? Say, you can't do it on your own. You need it. His strength. Most of his commands are so hard. I still work on them every day. I'm sure all of you are still working on them every day. You cannot accomplish all of them until we get to heaven, if you haven't heard that yet. The flesh, not meaning just the physical body, but it also includes our minds, will, and emotions, which are all subject to sin. And it refers in general to our unredeemed humanness. If you don't know the Lord, if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, but in Galatians 5.22, God has given us the fruits of the Spirit. And I'll be reading that scripture in a moment, but today I'll be speaking on this fruit, which is one of the hardest for me to obey, and that's gentleness. I guy for the job, right? All of you who have known me since I walked through those front doors and accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior know but I've been everything but gentle. I was very judgmental, not gentle. I'm about to make a rap song, ready? No, I'm sorry. I don't know why all these rhymes come at me. But by the grace of God, and I would say this, it's by His grace, after coming out of a place of violence and drugs 
and drinking and so many other evil ways of living that I've learned. God is teaching me day after day and year after year to learn to be gentler. And he's still teaching me. Pastor Layton once said it in a sermon, it's an ongoing process. It's a process for all of us. But I will continue to persevere and learn in the fear of the Lord. Because in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is in sight. This respectful fearness and appreciating submissive fear is the foundation for all spiritual knowledge and wisdom. While those who don't know Jesus make statements about life and truth, they don't know and they don't have the truth until they accept Jesus Christ into their lives. So let's talk about the subject of gentleness and how to become a gentler person. It takes a lot of effort to obey God's commands, but we need to always do our best. And sometimes offering ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, as it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it has to be this way. God offered us a sacrifice, his son Jesus. So we need to sacrifice ourselves. The fruits of the Spirit are characteristics of a follower of Jesus Christ. And gentleness today may be the single most misunderstood spirit-produced virtue of the nine that are listed in Galatians chapter 5. It's funny, when I thought about this, all these qualities that are listed can be used to guide you to gentleness. If you have the spirit of love, you'll be gentle. If you have the spirit of joy, gentleness will show in your joy. If you have peace, how can you not be gentle? You will definitely need patience to be gentle. If you're kind and good, gentleness is already in your wheelhouse. Faithfulness and self-control, it's these that are essential in your pursuit of gentleness. Gentleness is usually described as a positive spin on weakness. But gentleness in the Bible doesn't show a lack of strength, but instead an example of God's power. Gentleness doesn't show a lack of ability, but gives the added ability to help anyone's strength so that it serves good living, life-giving ends instead of bad life-taking ends. You think about the rain. When it rains really hard, when it's pouring hard rain, it can destroy life. But gentle rain will give life. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 2. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass, and like showers upon the herb. That sounds very gentle, doesn't it? Yep. I should make you guys read it all at the same time, but we don't have time. When farmers pray for rain, they pray for gentle rain. The way rain comes to them is very important. We need water. That's the power of life. Give it to us gently, not intensely. And when it's given gently, it gives life and it doesn't take life. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4 says, A gentle tongue is a tree of life. A gentle spoken word will usually bring life and healing, but gentle speech can also be used to cover up a vicious plan. Crushing the spirit, damaging self-esteem, and causing a whole lot of injury to someone. Gentle doesn't mean weak, but in certain situations, strong, with life-giving control, and giving something good, not like a fire hose or a power washer, blasting someone with hurtful, hurtful words or unkindness, but more like a gentle sprinkle of rain that helps and supports those in need of help and comfort. In Acts chapter 27, verse 13, a gentle blowing wind enters a sailor's prayer. But in Acts chapter 27, verse 18, it shows that a violent wind spells trouble. In Isaiah 40, 10 and 11, the virtue of gentleness is seen in God himself, who comes with might. How does he wield his strength toward his people? He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Violence is a destructive use of strength. I can vouch for that. Gentleness is a life-giving exercise that will strengthen us as we live out our Christian life for the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. I'm going to make sure you're all still awake because I'm talking very gentle. <laughs> I know it's soothing to the ears. <laughs> so what's the key? What's the key to gentleness? Here's five steps to becoming a gentler person. 
One, be understanding, not demanding. Two, be accepting, not rejecting. Three, yes, I know, I'm rapping again. Be tender without surrender. Four, be teachable, not unreachable. Five, be proactive, not reactive. Everyone wants friends. There was this book that was titled How to Win Friends and Influence People. It was the number two best-selling book a few years back. Why did it sell so many copies? Because everyone wants to be liked. We all want friends. At least, I hope we did. I know I do. I love friends. And we want them to be understanding and kind and gentle. So what is gentleness? Based on the original Greek word, which I'm not going to say because I can't pronounce them, it's used in the New Testament, which, is, which I'm not good for sure, the word gentleness literally means strength under control. The word was used to describe a wild stallion that was tamed or unbro untamed or broken. The broken stallion still had its power, it still had its energy, as it did when it was wild, but now it could be controlled and made useful for its master. Kind of sounds like me before Christ. I had to be broken. I had to be broken. I came here and I was so hard, and I, and I had something had to happen, and I had to I had to do work for my master. I had to be under control for him, and the only way I had to be broken, and God broke me. Some of you have known me, saw when I came in, it was just, I was so hard. All of a sudden, the tears started flowing, and God started working on this hardened heart. And I was broken, and I'm broken for God. And I, I'm so happy it did. James chapter 3, verse 17 says this, that the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. I never learned any of these fruits in my life as I was growing up. I lived in a neighborhood where there was nothing but chaos. I got in fights almost every day. Violence was an everyday thing. How in the world would I ever learn God's wisdom of being gentle in the situation that I was in? Being obedient or submissive to the word of God was the answer. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. We all have to be broken. We have to be obedient. And we have to be submissive to God's word. So now let's go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such these things there is no law. Gentleness is having a humble and gentle attitude that is patiently submissive in every type of offense and having no desire for revenge or payback. If my wife is listening to this at home, she's probably going, yeah! <laughs> I loved revenge my whole life. And believe me, for 16 years, over 16 years now, it's been a struggle. I love revenge. God took it away. Yeah. But the devil's always lurking. Just this one time. Yeah. Or you can do it this way instead of that way. And I have to sit there and I have to get on my knees. Lord, help me. I don't want to be like that anymore. I want to be dead. Yeah. In the New Testament is used to describe three attitudes. Submission to the will of God, Colossians 3.12. Teachability, James 1.21. And consideration of others, Ephesians 4.2. Philippians 4, 4-5 4 tells us rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We've sung it many times here. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Here Paul calls the Philippians to be of joy and reason so that they replace their anxiety with fervent, grateful prayer. Fervent prayer. Are you living a life of prayer to get you through those commands that God throws at you? Maybe mine is gentleness. Maybe yours is joy. Maybe yours is patience. I think I have almost every one of them that I struggle with. But we need to be fervent. We need to be in prayer, encouraging each other, praying together, praying alone, praying in your car, praying. Don't close your eyes, right? We all know that. Not while you're driving. <laughs> he also calls them to think about and practice Christian virtues. Gentleness is controlling your reactions towards people. It's choosing your own response to people instead of reacting to them. Even deeper, it's choosing God's response on how to react to people. First, be understanding, not demanding. When you come in contact with people, be understanding, not demanding. Another hard one for me. 
I used to love telling people what to do, and sometimes you might catch me doing that. Philippians chapter 2, 3, 4 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. How do you respond to people around you? Are you rude and demanding? I know I've been. Sometimes I still can be. Maybe you might come around me when I'm having a bad day. Remember, everyone around you has bad days. One thing Pastor Don used to tell me is put yourself in their shoes, Ted. I used to go, ah, God, did you see what he did? Did you see how he was? Did you? Put yourself in their shoes, Ted. You never know what someone's going through in their life. They could have lost a job. They could have lost a loved one. They could have had a broken relationship. So many things that we don't think about when somebody's being rude. We have to remember, you have to have gentleness, patience towards those people. Another one I'm still working on. But look beyond your own needs and agendas and notice that other people have needs just like you do. Being understanding and demanding toward people who are around you and see how God blesses you and blesses them. Next is be accepting, not rejecting. When someone accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior, you know what happens? They become part of our family. Our church in the high, church of the Highlands family, and they become part of our fellowship. And sometimes they come rough at first, like me. But we're not perfect, and we all need to just get along. Heard that before, right? Mm -hmm. We need to be the light to those around us, especially those who come to visit us here at this church. We need to show kindness instead of rudeness. When people come into this house or into a group setting here, they need to feel the love of God. Amen. Amen. I've been through this before this whole pandemic, and I've seen crowds going in and forth, but I've seen the little clicks. Are they even looking over the shoulder to see somebody new coming through the door? We should be looking for new people coming through the door. If you don't recognize them, go up and introduce yourself and say hello, because that's your brother or your sister in Christ, or it could be your brother or sister in Christ. We get so excited because we see our brothers and sisters after a long week of work, and we just go through all these work things all day long. Ah, I hate being here at work. And then you come here on Sunday and you see all your friends and your brothers and sisters in Christ. And you're like, yes. And forget about the people that come in. Nothing feels worse than being rejected. And nothing feels better than being accepted. Amen? Amen. Romans 15, 7 says, Therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. God puts up with a lot from each and every one of us. And if he puts up with our nonsense... And weaknesses, we should learn to put up with other shortcomings, too. The more you recognize God's grace for you, the more gracious you'll be to everyone else. That's something that I do every day when I don't want to have grace, or I don't want to be gentle, or I don't want to have patience. I have to remember, man, what did he go through with me? Be accepting, not rejecting. Next, be tender without surrender. When someone disagrees with you, be tender without surrender. You'll never be able to get along with everyone, even though we would love it that way. But not even Jesus could get everyone to get along. You're always going to meet people who want to argue about something. Some people will dispute everything that you say. How should you respond to those people? With gentleness. I want to hear everybody. With gentleness. Okay. <laughs> With gentle. <laughs> One of the tests of spiritual maturity is how you handle people who disagree, disagree with you. That's been a tough one my whole time as a Christian. Some people have a need to destroy anyone who disagrees with them. If you challenge them or offer a comparison or complaint or criticism, they come back with a full-blown personal attack, like a power washer. I'm not talking about or a fire hose. You get blasted. Then what do you do? You have three alternatives. You can retreat, you can attack, or you can respond in gentleness. Most people choose retaliating, retreating, or attacking. Very few know how to respond in gentleness, and so many don't want to. I don't want to. If you give in and retreat from confrontational people, you'll say, okay, have it your way. Peace at any price brings many hidden costs to any relationship. On the other hand, if you attack, you take the offensive and fight back when someone opposes you. Attacking is usually a sure sign that you feel insecure and threatened by someone's disapproval. And anger is a warning light that tells you that you're about to lose something. And that's usually your self-esteem. Me, me, 
me. But I learned, and I'm teachable. And that's very important, to be teachable. No one knows this better than me. When people attack, the most common reaction is to become sarcastic and attack the other person's self-worth. The third alternative is responding in gentleness. This is how God wants you to react to conflicts. This kind of response calls for a balance between maintaining your right to an opinion while equally respecting another's right to his or her opinion. I've had many people tell me, oh, I spoke to this other religion, people, and you know, they just don't want to hear it. And just, you know, you got to be gentle or they don't want to hear anything. And even if they hear it, it doesn't mean anything's going to happen. I mean, if somebody comes to me and tries to turn me from my relationship with Christ, you know, listen. But it's not going to happen. So don't expect that just because you're gentle with someone that they're going to listen and it's going to change everything because sometimes it doesn't change anything. It forces us to be tender without surrendering your convictions. Romans 14.1 says, As for the one who is weak in faith, Welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. I remember Francis Chan told me once, he said, you know, I went to all these seminaries, I went to all these things. He said, Ted, for me, I think that was the most waste of time I had because all I wanted to do was prove how right I was. All I wanted to show everybody is how much I knew. But when he gave all that up and then he went downtown San Francisco and just started serving the Lord, you see, that's all that matters. I have people come to me all the time. Yeah, but do you know what God says about this? Tell me what you think. Of, you know, I don't want to get into debates. I just want to serve God with all my heart That's right. because he had a son, Jesus, died for me. That's right. That's all that matters. Amen? Amen. Remember that. Welcome those with open arms who don't see the things the way you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Even when you see that they're strong in their opinions but weak in the faith department. So many people, even that don't know Jesus, are arguing. They have no idea what they're talking about, but you've got to be gentle. They have their own history to deal with. Proverbs 15, 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So true. When someone asks you a question, if you respond in arrogance, the questioner will probably challenge you. But if you respond gently, the questioner will be more likely to be open to the answer. Speak in a gentle voice. And they will be all ears. Mm -hmm. See, I was speaking to Jeff and everybody's like, <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. If I started going, You have to listen to me today, you have to be gentle, you guys probably get up and walk out of here, amen? Amen. <laughs> this one guy, Amen, get me all out of here. <laughs> Gotta be my cousin. <laughs> James chapter 3, 16, 17 says, For, we, for, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. James, James pinpoints the cause of quarrels and arguments, selfishness, wanting our own way and demanding that others need to agree with us because we know it all. But he goes on to say that wise people are peaceful, pure, gentle, and friendly. I know people that are very intelligent, but they can also be very obnoxious. They know it all and listen to nothing. They're not friendly, they're not peaceable, and they're not gentle. They go around trying to impress everyone with their knowledge. That one gets me. Sometimes they won't even let you finish what you're saying. If you're truly a wise person, you're going to be gentle. Gentleness is the ability to disagree agreeably. You can walk hand in hand with someone if you if you see without seeing eye to eye. You can agree to disagree and still be agreeable. Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.23, one of my favorites, he said, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently, enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them the repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. Paul is saying that gentleness is a qualification for a servant of God, a follower of Jesus Christ. If I'm a servant of the Most High, I'm not going to get caught up in arguments. Don't get me wrong. doesn't mean that I don't. I struggle sometimes. I try to keep my mouth shut because I know what the Bible says in James chapter 3 about the tongue. It can start a fire. We should not get involved in petty disagreements and pointless conflicts. And right after this, Paul gave us the reason not to argue in verse 26. 
that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. You know, when I watch a bad movie, sometimes the actors are doing a decent job. But you know what? I always have to go, there's someone behind us who didn't know what they're doing. It's the director. And there's a director that's after each and every one of us that wants to write his story in our lives. It's the devil. He wants to make you do things that are not of God. But there's people sometimes, instead of arguing with them, we need to understand, especially if they don't know Jesus, that they might be caught up. The devil might have them in his grasp. And we need to be gentle. We need to be kind. So that way they would see a whole new different type of living. And what do you have that I don't have? And they will come to their senses. Amen? Amen. Uh, Paul often describes humanity as enslaved by the devil and in need of rescue. Deception is Satan's trap. He's a seasoned, scheming, clever, and refined teller of lies. And he has many people trapped, especially now. Knowing the end is near, he's like a caged animal lashing out at everybody, trying to get everybody to go with him. You don't have to give up your convictions, but you need to be tender in the way you express yourself to them. Let's look at the fourth aspect. Be teachable, not unreachable. When someone corrects you, be teachable, not unreachable. James 1, 119 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. How many of us have read that? And I think we've all heard it. God gave us two ears and one mouth. Which one are we supposed to use more? If you're quick to listen and slow to answer back, you're going to be slow to lose your temper. If you want to be a gentle person, use your ears more than your mouth and be willing to accept correction. I've had many people come to me, and I kind of go, no way. I mean, but I'm learning. It doesn't happen all the time, but I have to go home, and I have to pray and get on my knees and ask, Lord, is this, this person just told me this, and I'm not agreeing on it. What do you think? And then I have to go to his word. Gentle can be overlooked as meek. People tend to connect meekness with weakness. Yet Jesus called himself meek in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29 in the King James Version, and he absolutely wasn't afraid of anyone. Moreover, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The meek, the gentle, will inherit the earth because they are God's kind of people. They are gentle but strong. Those who are gentle, those who are meek are teachable, not unreachable. The wisest people I know are the people who have a teach-me attitude. They're willing to learn from others. That's one thing Pastor Don told me he loved about me. Even though I didn't like it, I was teachable. I think Leighton learned that also. You can learn from anyone, even someone new in the faith. Through my years of counseling and preaching, I find myself being uh, learning from those I'm counseling sometimes. And usually from my preaching, I'm always being convicted, like today. As I'm reading this, I'm going, Eee, oh my God, fix that. <laughs> And then I go home, and I'm going to be tossing and turning now. But, but last, be proactive, not reactive. Peter talked about how Jesus acted at his trial before Pilate. When he was reviled, he did not revile and return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to God who judges justly. When Jesus went to trial, he could have commanded all the angels in heaven to come down and rescue him in an instant. But Jesus endured the trial in silence. Who was really in control of that situation? Was Pilate? Or was Jesus? The spiritual dynamics of that confrontation are pretty fascinating, fascinating to me. Pilate was threatened by the simple fact that Jesus wouldn't speak and defend himself. I'm sure it made Pilate wonder, what's up with this guy? Instead of reacting to Pilate, why didn't you have been me? I'm sorry. I might have said, the people, I might have said something. You're going to get me out of here? But Jesus... Stayed silent. Jesus took control of the situation by choosing to stay silent. He didn't need to react to Pilate's insults because he knew exactly who he was. But someone hurts you. Are you reactive or preactive? Proactive. Checklist is the ability to handle hurt without retaliating. It's the ability to take the blow without striking back. You may say, that's not easy to do. And I say, you are absolutely right. It's almost impossible, but all things are possible with God. Amen? Amen. To respond that way isn't natural. It's supernatural. It's the fruit of the Spirit, and the Spirit is in each and every one of us that has accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen.
When someone stabs you in the back, happened to me many times, when someone hurts you, what do you do? Do you pull out the big guns and react? Big guns? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, I've been working out. <laughs> on the weights and on the food. <laughs> and my guys that I work out will tell you I'm everything but gentle. Right, Lee? <laughs> I should just have you sit up here with me. <laughs> Maybe you react and show anger. When you do that, you're admitting that someone else is controlling your emotions. You're acknowledging that you've given that person the power to determine your feelings and your reactions. Remember this, no one can take that control from you. You give it away the moment you start reacting. Try hard to be proactive, not reactive. God's word tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And later on in the same chapter, verse 21, it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the power of being proactive instead of reactive. To re retaliate is to react. To forgive is to be proactive. It's saying I will choose the way that I respond. Gentleness is strength under control. Choosing the way that responds to people. The person who can control his mood is strong and he is gentle. If you take on gentleness, you'll have more, a more relaxed lifestyle. You'll become more easygoing and more able to roll with the punches. One person I think of as easy going, and I always think of this man every day. He's gone now from here. He's not dead, but he moved as Pastor Owens. I would never see him get angry or mad. Nothing could shake him up. I laughed at him when we played golf. He still didn't get mad. He always seemed to be in control of his emotions, always cheerful, always or concerned, but never angry. And he always had some scripture ready when it was needed, and he would, he would gently deliver it. I truly respect him. I remember I took him golfing with a friend of mine. My friend said, hey, no, no God stuff today. We're playing golf, right? And the first hole, he hits a shot, and Pastor Owen said, you know what the Lord says about that shot? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And the guy looked at me, and I went, every hole, Pastor Owen does <laughs> I don't think the guy had a very good day at golf. <laughs> but we had an excellent sermon, Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but you would think someone would get burned out from always trying to do the right thing and be gentle all the time. One reason some people experience emotional burnout is they're not gentle. They're always demanding. They're judging others. They're always having to prove a point. They don't want to learn from others, and they react to situations going from one reaction to another. Prideful is the word for that. God hates pride, and I have a lot in that game, and I still do. He's chiseling it away. God wants us to have healthy, happy lives. That's why he gave us the scripture in Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'm glad I didn't get self-control. That would have been a really hard one. But let's strive to live out the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Let me end with this. Colossians chapter 3, 12, 17. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which, is, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. Amen. Amen. Through Him. Putting on Christ. Paul calls the Colossians to a holy lifestyle, consistent with their new identities. That's what we need to do. Are you a new person? Are you dead to your old life? You need to put the past behind you. God has a plan for each and every one of us. His plan for us is to love one another. Love God first, love one another. And to do that, we need to be gentle with one another. We're not going to always agree with one another. But it doesn't mean we have to fight with one another. Some of us might be going through something. Some of you might be going through something. I might take it a bad way. Let's not be like that. Let's just learn to love, be gentle towards each other, and remember that God is gentle with us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Get your communion ready, please. If you don't have them there on the streaming, grab your communion. You might be sitting there eating scrambled eggs or something. That'll work. <laughs> so 
Tony Parker got a big French toast in front of him on their plate while we're doing this. They're going, hey, I'm comedian. God is so good. He is so good. That we can come to him right now. That we can unload. I love saying that. That we can unload. Some of us have things going on. Some of us don't want to be gentle. Some of us are not at peace. Some of us are mad at the government. Some of us are mad at God. But we need to go before him today and know that God is in full control of every single thing. And I always say this, not even a blade of grass moves without his permission. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Whatever you're hanging on to, give it to God. This is your time with Him. Remembering what Jesus done for us. Remember that He died for us. So we can have peace. Thank you, Lord. Such a forgiving God. Thank you, Lord. Let's take the bread. Now, Lord, thank you for who you are in our lives, and thank you for your word. Help us today, Lord. Guide us with the precious Holy Spirit that's in each and every one of us to be more gentle, to be more peaceful. To show those who are lost your precious light. We thank you, Lord, for this day. Use us, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Y'all have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of your day. Be gentle. <laughs> Come to you, Woo! Yeah.